Gestating the Curious Minds involves adult themes and situations. Just a warning. <laughs> Are you going to do it again? Red leather, yellow leather? Red leather, yellow leather. Say it faster. Red leather, yellow leather. Red faster. leather, yellow leather. Faster. Red leather, yellow leather. More! <laughs> Add more words. <laughs> Moses supposes his toeses are roses, but Moses supposes erroneously. For nobody's toeses we know as are roses as Moses supposes his toeses to be. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard and the most complicated thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Say it again, but replace Moses with Titmouse. <laughs> Titmouse supposes his toeses are roses, but Titmouse supposes erroneously. For nobody's toeses we noses as roses, our Titmouse supposes his toeses to be. You're a goddamn robot. Welcome to Gestating the Curious Minds, where we drink the bubbling cream from the altar of the written word. We're your entertainers, Glenn and Gertie Nuzzles. Allow us to shine a light on the process of creation for the most splendiferous fiction genre, paranormal smut. (laughs) Oh, Gertrude! (laughs) (laughs) You're the best! Well, thank you. So, we're doing chapter one. We're going to basically think up chapter one and figure out what we're going to outline here for this chapter. And then what's the plan? We're going to try and write it and then read that chapter at the beginning of our next episode as we think up chapter two. Is this our plan? That sounds about right to me. Okay. And then by the end of it, everyone will, anyone that's listened to this all the way through will have already heard every chapter, but then we have an episode where we just read the thing. Yes, because you have a beautiful reading voice. Can you join in on it? Can you be the water ghost, the sexy water ghost? Sure. This could be like an audio play and not an audio book. Ooh. Yeah, with sound effects. I got a sweet sight with free sound effects. (laughs) (laughs) Just something some guy makes in his basement. (laughs) You're way better at sound effects than I am, though. No, how? Yeah, with with your... Oh, my karate chops? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Also, you can't stand when I do pouring a Coca-Cola. We'll see if that picks up. It's very accurate. But you said you hate it. It makes me feel weird in my neck and teeth, yeah. <laughs> Your teeth? <laughs> I can understand the neck because my skin always bunches up in the back of my neck whenever anyone does anything embarrassing and I feel bad for them. But I've never felt anything in my teeth. <laughs> no, it's not like it's secondhand embarrassment. It's like my body is reacting to that sound. And it's not, like some people like ASMR. I'm not an ASMR person. Don't get you wet? They like the tingles. I don't like the tingles. Huh. Do you get tingles from ASMR? Yeah, and it's unpleasant. Where do you get those tingles? In the head and neck. Oh, man, that's not sexy. Not vaginally. All right, fine. Well, this is already turning out to be a turd fest of an episode. Uh, What are we looking at today for our first chapter? Let's go to our uh, chapter one outline. Um, So we are going to be focusing on uh, John C. Pemberton today. We want to make sure that our listeners understand who he is, where he comes from, what are his motivations. We should maybe also review quickly what we came up with in our last episode, the overall outline that we're working with, trying to make a story out of, uh, that we're doing chapter one of. Do you want to read that off? It's at the bottom of story outline. Uh, Okay. So we um, rolled for all of our parts of a story Uh, last episode. Go ahead and take a listen to that. (laughs) Um, But if you're like, no, I don't want to listen to that. We're going to be (laughs) focusing on our protagonist, John Stith Pemberton. Um, We may or may not meet his love interest in the first chapter. I don't know if that would behoove us. That'd be what? Behoove us. Oh, behoove us. Behoove. I thought that that wouldn't be hovis. No. no. (laughs) What's hovis? What's a (laughs) hovis? All right, fine. May so, or may yeah. not, but he does live with two ghosts. Uh, Mateo Gibbs, who we're imagining is Val Kilmer from the movie. Pure Genius? Pure I genius. showed you a little bit of it, and you got yeah. to see how ridiculous it's it is. very 80s. Yeah, the opening um, scene is him walking in, and he's got uh, like little space alien googly 
antenna. Like a headband. Yeah, like a headband Which is antenna. so funny because he's one of the top ten minds in the country. Yeah, but he's so just he's so wacky. So he's just a silly, goofy guy. And he's you know? always wearing Hawaiian shirts, and he's so unconventional. He's, he's wild, yeah. dude. You never the, know his next move, but he's a genius. He's a genius. He didn't ride a skateboard at any point, but boy, was he a lot of fun. We can assume that he did. Yeah. Um, and then we have our... Oops. I got those backwards. So our comic relief ghost is going to be Val Kilmer. His name yeah. is Maximilian Hamilton, and our heckler ghost, Matteo Gibbs, um, who's going to be kind of like a, a Newman a la Seinfeld. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> grumpy and shitty. So this is going to take place on uh, the mountaintop of uh, Chugwater, Georgia. Mm-hmm. This to, it's not real. <laughs> Chugwater isn't real? Chugwater, Georgia is not real. Oh, it's not? No. Where did we get that name from? I literally don't know. Yeah, we were looking up a lot of stuff. Yeah. We rolled for everything that we see here. Uh, and then also, yeah, I think you just got a name generator for like funnynamedtowns.com. That's very possible. Yeah. Because Coca-Cola, uh, which we discussed, of course, John Stith Pemberton is the inventor of Coca-Cola. Heck yeah. As everyone knows, you know, it's common knowledge. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> he was actually born in Knoxville, Georgia. And Coca-Cola is famously from um, produced in Atlanta, Georgia. So there is a chug water in Wyoming. I don't oh. know why he eh. ended up with chug water, Georgia. Well, you keep saying it's remember. anachronistic. That's a word you keep throwing at me every five seconds, every time I complain about anything not being uh, historically accurate. Well, exactly. That more has to do with uh, time mm-hmm. and how time works. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but we threw the whole thing out. Uh, so this is taking place in Chugwater, Georgia. And of course, uh, John Stith Pemberton is living in his mountaintop mansion. What's it uh, called? The Forested Tip Estate. <laughs> <laughs> Forested Tip is kind of one of the best names. It's fantastic. We should name this home that we stay in the Forested Tip. I love that. It's a great name. It's not the tip of anything. Minnesota is very flat. Okay. Well, this is the flattest on. place okay, I've ever on. lived in we're my goddamn on. life. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you can make fun of it all you want. Pretty soon you're going to be speaking Minnesotan, uh, just like the thing I made you listen to from uh, the podcast on Cited, where they make fun of oh. how I talk. And I talk normal. You but talk totally normal, except when you say rough. Rough. Ruts. Ruts. No, I'm not saying it this way. Whatever. Point is, <laughs> they were trying to make fun of me by saying, like, oh, geez, and uh, what do they say, casserole? But then you pointed out it's not called casserole here in Minnesota because you're it's already hot turning. Dish. It's hot dish. You're already turning into one of us. Well, that was because your family was so sweet. Um, was it for my birthday? They got me a an official hot dish cookbook. Oh, they did? Yeah. Yeah, they did. Which was so sweet of them. Yeah. Did you so ever make cute. a hot dish? No, I think that book is here somewhere. I don't know if I ever took it back with me. Well, don't ever look at this episode. And now all my it's shit is feelings. here. So. Well, all right, fine. No, because <laughs> Kim's always making that. She makes great hot dish. Why should I make my own hot dish when I she makes fantastic no, hot dish? No, they made you a hot dish on one of the first times we got together when you moved out here, and they, Brian made a big old hot oh, dish. Yeah. Oh, man, that thing just fills your belly with warm slop. So good. And you just sit there and fester in it. I feel like Kim made a... a tuna biscuit hot dish for my birthday. Oh, yeah. That makes sense. Because my mom used to make tuna biscuits, so she wanted yeah. to give so you the good. experience we grew up with. Delicious. Anyway, we're anyway, distracted so, by hot yeah. dish. Screw unsighted. They don't even know what it's really like being uh, Midwestern. <laughs> they tried their best. <clears throat> they tried their oh. best, but they're Canadian. I Christian... What? I, I Christian named you. <laughs> oh. I gotta edit that out. You're gonna have to bleep it out. I'll bleep it out. All right, so... Guy's got a bat on his neck. This is kind of the overall of what we came up with in the last episode. Yes, that's one of his uh, his faults, <laughs> his bats. <laughs> so yep. we decided that he has a bat on his neck uh, that is uh, not something that can be removed. Uh, Glenn, do you want to share with us the thought process? Well, on our last episode, you had said that if anyone ever gets anything pierced through them, to never try to remove it unless you're by a professional or wait, are you talking about just why the bat? You have to be bat? like in an OR for yeah. you to remove it or else you're just going to bleed out. So, the so idea you leave it stuck in. I came up with later after we recorded the episode was 
that back then maybe they still know this golden rule even though they can't apply it because they don't have the technology or the ability to stop the bleeding. So they say, as he says, I got this bat stuck on my neck and I don't want to remove it. And the doctors say, yeah, no, you shouldn't remove it because you can't remove something like that unless there's a professional there to actually treat it on the spot, like at an OR. But we don't have the technology to treat it, so we're not going to remove it. (laughs) (laughs) And then he puts on his, like, dentist apron. (laughs) And goes and yanks hair. a tooth out of someone's head. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Barber and dentist. Reaches over, sniffs off a lock of hair. Yeah, exactly. I got that from, uh, and I found out that's actually true, from uh, the Marvelous Miss Adventure. Yeah, Flapjack. Yeah. Because they Dr. had Dr. Barber. Barber. And it turns out that was actually a thing. You'd have doctors that also got hair. <laughs> <laughs> and that was like a normal combining of professions. Um, so, yeah, that's the reason why he has the bat stuck to his neck. They try to apply leeches and stuff. Nothing happened. Uh, if anything, you were just saying a little while ago that it just uh, the leeches suck blood out of the bat, which just makes the bat more, or the bat more angry and hungry, so it just sucks more <laughs> blood out of the main character. <laughs> so it just only ruins it. Uh, so anyways, he's got these two ghosts, the uh, comic relief ghost and the heckler ghost, that I don't know why. So since we're talking about Chapter 1, I guess we can talk about it a little bit. At what point did they say you got to get out of the house? You got to get over this whole having a bat in your neck. I was wondering, did he used to be a playboy and got laid a lot, and then now with the bat on his neck, he's just kind of like hiding in his haunted uh, pine tip, mountain tip. What is it called again? Forested tip. Forested tip. tip. Uh, he's hiding out there, and then these ghosts tell him to why don't you go out to the public pool and show off that beautiful body of yours? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they won't notice the bat <laughs> clawing at your throat. <laughs> I think that's a good idea. I think that um, we don't necessarily have to introduce why the place is haunted or what kind of relationship that no. these people have. It'll no, come out through dialogue. We don't need to. Uh, so I think it should just start with him moping and. Through that, we can add that kind of exposition sure. of the thoughts of why, you know, what happens with the bat. and um, That's a good point. We should I, introduce what happened to the bat. Yeah. I mean, this first chapter, don't want to spend a lot of time on, but we want to explain everything so we can dive into the story, as crappy books do. Uh, within the right. first 15 pages, you have explained everything about his history up to the up to the moment. Uh, but then, yeah, after that, then I guess chapter two is... Will just be him going to the pool. <laughs> I think that's fantastic. Let's speed this along. <clears throat> yeah. Because you know what? There, there's not going to be uh, a whole lot to dissect. No. Um, I think this is a pretty straightforward story. And yeah, it we seems like rush it, the bat to in the, the neck sex and everything. Anyway, <laughs> let's get to the good know, stuff, dude. Let's get to dude. the sex. Okay, well, chapter one, I was thinking that we need to. Unless you got anything you want to add, things to make sure we do in this chapter. We got to define the year, which we know is 1708. 1704. 1704. The place, which is the forested tip, and it's haunted. The protagonist, we got to find him. His fault, which is his bat. And his ghost friends, I put maybe. Uh, I guess they could be there at the end to definitely. But I don't know if we need to. Like you said, we don't have to explain them. They can just be there. It's just haunted. Yeah. The estate is simply haunted. <laughs> We're just accepting that it's haunted. We don't need to explain why, how long these ghosts have been here. True. It's like, um, I don't think we learned about uh, the ghosts of Hogwarts until until later. They like sort the of explain third or fifth book. Which we're not going to do that with that? this. It'd be insane if at some point somebody came along and fifth. said, "We'd like you to make an entire series out of this." I know. Because <laughs> I'm just saying, it was no. Pretty deep <laughs> into the the series. You know, we just kind of th- there were ghosts. So that's yeah. kind of what I'm thinking. There well, you, are these ghosts. We could do. So he's going to meet another ghost at the public pool eventually. We're not writing about this now. But what if there's something, thought for later, what if there's something about his home that is the prime spot for ghosts? The reason why it's haunted is because there's something about the forested tip that is, like, great for ghosts. And that's why this lady ghost in the public pool is dying for him to set up a private pool to get up there oh. so she can stay up there. We don't have to think of this now, but it's something we can noodle for, noodle for later. Maybe that's what he finds out later that She's gives him that self-doubt. Oh, 
Oh, she's just using it. Make a note. Are you Let's making make a note? Let's make that a note. Make yeah. a note about that. Because I know there was a note in here where you describe her as a greedy money person a la well, Nicole was, and a Nicole Smith. Uh, maybe that's it. Maybe that's the, the big thing. We just got to figure out what makes his place so sweet for ghosts. It's a sweet, sweet place, man. <laughs> What would it be? There's what is it the like the ghost hunters always talk about? Like um, it's oh god, what's that one asylum? Or no, it's the hotel that Stephen King went to that he wrote about for The Shining. Oh, the one in Colorado. But it's what's got it these called? like the what, Stanley Hotel. But it's got like salt caves, or there's some sort of rock that they claim. Like oh yeah, ghosts just love this kind of shit. Like they just stick to these rocks. It could be something like that. I thought ghosts hated salt. No, there was something about it. I forget. There's like a whole theory with ghost hunters. But you can protect yourself with a salt ring. That's true. From a ghost. I had to do that for my youngest kid. So my youngest used to think that their bedroom was haunted, uh, and it's because they kept seeing shadows going back and forth outside their bedroom window. But the bedroom window actually faced the driveway for the crappy white trash neighbors that lived right outside it. So they were constantly coming and going all night long. They had this big yard light, so it would just shine shadows against the window. But they were convinced there was ghosts, so uh, to make them feel better, I got a. I, we got on the internet and I looked up how to protect yourself from ghosts, and they mentioned putting down salt, like across windows and doors. And so then the two of us like didn't want to lay salt down everywhere, so we got little Ziploc baggies full of salt and just kind of oh. lined them up <laughs> along the windows and along the door and That's stuff. That's adorable. And I'm like, now you are protected, my friend. <laughs> that is so sweet. Well, they actually slept and they stopped bothering me in the middle of the night, so it definitely worked. I don't know how sweet it was. I just wanted to get some sleep. That's adorable. Eh. Moving on. (laughs) Uh, So we don't have to think specifically, unless we wanted to find it in the first chapter, we don't have to think specifically, like, why do ghosts love this place? Why do these two ghosts come to his place and just hang out and become his friends? And he doesn't have any friends. He's got a bat on his neck, so he's not complaining. Right. But anyways, later on, we can try and figure out why would this ghost be like, you live at the forested tip? I will suck your dick if you put a pool up there that I can stay in. (laughs) He's like, suck my dick now. No, no, I'll make it. I'll do it later if you got a pool up there for me. And he's like, oh, well, just jerk me off with your feet. No, you got to put a pool up there first. (laughs) I love that. Fantastic. So that'll be, of course, later. But uh, I like that. So I've added that to our notes. All right. Year, place, protagonist, faults, ghost, friends. All right. So... We got the year. The year being... We have all of it. 1704. Do you want to get to writing then? Well, here's the deal. Do you want to make this just a short episode or... No, we're going to make this short episode. Um, I was thinking we'll kind of come up with... We got to find the year, the place, whatever. We just did all that. No, within this chapter. So I was thinking... I was thinking, if we're going to talk about the year, the best way to introduce the year is in the laziest possible way, which is having uh, the protagonist sitting there reading a newspaper, which I found out that the Boston Newsletter was the first continuously published newsletter that started in that year, Uh, 1704, 8, 4. Did the Boston Newsletter reach Georgia? Doesn't matter. We're going to assume Anachronistic. Yes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he's just going to be like, I can't wait to open up this very first newspaper that's continuously published here in the year of whatever. He wouldn't know if it was continuously published because it just started in 1704. That's, well, it doesn't matter. So that's he's just going to be sitting there like, I just had this sent to me. Oh, boy. And he's like, wow, this is a great newspaper. He's going to find out that also on May 1st of that year, that newspaper published its very first advertisement. So be like, what is this? An advertisement for possibly bat guano or some sort of fertilizer treatment that you were just looking up earlier. But they, they did have their very first ad ever published, I guess, in any American newspaper in that year in this newspaper. So it could be something that could be what inspires him later to uh, come up with whatever fertilizer based uh, entrepreneurial stuff he wants to do in the future. Okay. It could be like... So he sees an ad for fertilizer. Yeah, what did you say? They're fertilizer... Tom's people Mostly are suspicious. Mostly ash and fish. Yeah, so it'd be like finest wood ash and fish fertilizer <laughs> <laughs> available. <laughs> and then as he reads that, he's like, huh, 
wood ash and fish. Then his bat will shit on the side of his shoulder. <laughs> and he'll be like, I get this stuff free all the time. Maybe I should do something with that someday in future chapters. Oh, so the bat shits on his shoulder and then he thinks, I'll oh, write the bat. And then we get the, oh, uh, the see, flashback to the bat. Flashback. To, that's how we introduce the bat is the bat shitting on his shoulder. Uh, it gets upset. It gets fussy on his neck and then uh, shits on his arm or whatever. So have we decided what he was doing when the bat bit his neck? Well, that's so now this him reading the newspaper. Also, I'll finish the newspaper thing because this is how we define the year okay. by lazily throwing out facts about that year. I thought it would be fun. So <laughs> there's the War of Spanish Succession where the English and the Dutch troops occupied Gibraltar. So I'm thinking we can just throw that. He's like, huh, can't believe they're occupying Gibraltar. Well, well. And then uh, he'll go and read about famous deaths that year, <laughs> which will be John Locke, the English physician and philosopher. And uh, also... Uh, Pierre Charles Le Sueur, the French American fur trader and explorer. <laughs> Le Sueur? Yeah, I've got this all down. So you don't have to okay, cool. Uh, <laughs> but I just like that he'll be like, oh, Pierre Charles Le Sueur died, the f- famous American fur trader? That's a shame. What a shame. <laughs> exactly. How terrible. And then I thought it'd be fun that if all of a sudden, because um, also when I was looking this up, famous births. Uh, was Benjamin Heath. Uh, he's an English scholar and author. And he'd be like, no, oh, uh, Benjamin Heath uh, was born today. Famous scholar and author. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how we define the year. That that's really, f- I love <laughs> Thank that. Thank you. I love that. <laughs> but because, and then maybe, maybe then he'll read an ad and then that ad will be for fertilizer that's based on uh, wood ash and fish. And he'll be like, oh, interesting. And then that's when the bat will shit on his arm and then we'll introduce the bat at that point. Perfect. Taking notes? Yes. Cute. Great. Uh, And then, so, we never talked about how he gets the bat. Um, No, let's dive on into that. I was wondering, since we have to make sure that sex is happening in this book at some point, quickly. Damn it. Quickly. Within the first chapter, it'd be great. First chapter, yeah. So, you can shoot this down. This is just an idea. Uh, Is he hot as hell and he used to be a big playboy and we can introduce some crazy sex scene? With some forbidden woman that has her father's rich estate and he was working her. I don't know. Some sort of weird, I don't know, scenario from like an old, I, my brain is pooping. But No, I understand where you're going with well, that. He's like so a Mr. Darcy type, except like hornier. like a very steamy. Yeah, but he's steamy. And then all of a sudden a bat attacks his neck while he's having during sex During the tryst. He could be having anal sex with her because the books have got to get nasty. Ew. Okay. These books are all about anal sex. <laughs> I read Double Dirty Mountain Men, and it was tons of anal sex in that thing. <laughs> Which one was that? Was that the bear one? No, no just, was it was just two one. guys that found a woman that uh, her car, her truck broke down, and she was freezing. And instead of actually trying to get her to the hospital, they just took her back to their cabin, these two men, and uh, revived her and warmed her and then butt-fucked her. And that was apparently a hot book. It's supposed to be consensually, yes. Okay. But I mean, not really, because she was passed out for the time that they brought her back to the place and revived her with hot cocoa and their muscly chests. Yeah, that has implications. Yeah. Anyways. Okay. uh, So anyways, he could be having hot sex with someone, kind of like a weird scenario of like, oh, if I could only marry this woman with her father that owns uh, so much land here in the Forest of Tip. And then, uh, then I guess what, a bat attacks him? And we could use that to kind of describe how he looks. So he has a glorious beard mustache combo. Oh, whoa, whoa. A glistening, constantly glistening, to the point where his mother used to worry if he had glandular problems. <laughs> a glistening chest. <laughs> My mother always worried that I sweat too much, <laughs> even if it's cold out. Okay. He always looks like he was cutting wood. There you go. That's another reason why they can't take the bat off, because he's too slick. <laughs> well, also, they don't have the professionals to do it. The golden rule is never remove an item from your body unless the professional's there to remove it. Um, can we make something weird about this? What would be a weird trait that isn't attractive now that we can claim is highly attractive back then? Like real skinny legs? Because it shows you're affluent, because you never have to walk around very much? What would be a thing that's... He had the slenderest legs... And the softest feet. (laughs) (laughs) The softest feet. (laughs) Never walked a day in his life. (laughs) The softest feet. (laughs) 
<laughs> Pillowy supple. <laughs> like butter. <laughs> Creamy. Creamy little feet. <laughs> oh, tiny little feet. I can't wait to write creamy little feet. <laughs> Okay, so he's got slender little legs, creepy little feet, beautiful upper body like he chops wood, constantly glistening. And then what happens with this woman? We can maybe write a small sex scene in the first chapter. Uh, it has what is to his... be super. So he, maybe he was. Is she just like a the town whore or is she like the the rich daughter that he was trying to get with? Or like what what's going on with that? That we can just say within, like, two words. Well, and that then would, the bad attacks during sex. I think the type of trust he's having is going to define his character. Mm. So if he's trying to get with the daughter, then it's for money, which kind of sets sets up that he is already interested in money. Okay, so he's a shallow person. So if person, we want to do handsome. that. Yeah, he's using his body while he can, while he still looks good. While he still looks good. He's like his own little Anna Nicole Smith. <laughs> Which turns around at him later Which when this ghost is using him. That's exactly. why he's aware of it. Oh, okay. boy, oh, so boy. He is working on... I'm going to make her... Um, He's working on copulating with uh, the daughter of a wealthy family, wealthy local family. What aspects of her body are highly unattractive now that we can make very attractive back then? Just like the legs and the soft feet. Uh, her feet were very rough. That's the thing that's attractive for that We're time? trying to make her attractive or unattractive? Kind of like how he has slender legs and soft feet to yes. show that he's affluent and never has to walk around. What would be attractive about her along the same lines? But not just the legs. Like, what would it be? Uh, like real, real the long size fingers? of <laughs> Costco muffins. <laughs> With wrists the size of Costco muffins? Breasts. Oh, breasts. How big are Costco muffins? The tiny little They're things? big. Oh, they're big? They're honking. Okay, breasts the size of Costco muffins so that they're kind of lumpy, as if they've been holding back milk for years. Like That's she's been waiting to make works. babies for a long time. All right, fine. <laughs> Costco muffins. Hmm. Slender toes. How about a forehead that's real, real white because she never has to go outside for any reason? The palest forehead. The palest forehead. I love it. She's gorgeous. Everyone's forehead's got a little tint because you got to go outside at some point, but not her. No, she doesn't go outside. No, she never no. has to. Uh, or if she does go outside, she only goes outside out in the evening or at night. So they're meeting in the orange groves, <gasps> uh, peach groves. She, hold on, because she only goes out at night, plus it's the south, there's mosquitoes, right? So she's covered in bug bites. But she's pale as hell, which is very attractive because it means she never goes out during daylight. <laughs> it's always in twilight and evening hours. She's like, oh, she's covered in bug bites, dude. You know she never goes out in labors during the day. <laughs> so they're swatting away mosquitoes. <laughs> which is the most romantic experience. As he's mouth romancing her mm-hmm. nipples. There you go. And uh, he feels a sharp pain in his neck. <laughs> <laughs> now is she desperate enough that she tries to look past the bat but he's so self-conscious he runs away in shame or is she screaming that he's got a bat stuck to his neck and like get away from me you heathen she's definitely screaming about the bat okay uh and i feel like this would probably have uh religious implications oh so he's just outcast does she call him a warlock or something some kind of man witch. A man witch? <laughs> the sandwich? <laughs> like a sandwich. The sandwich in a can? Man witch? Like, we shouldn't be having sex right now. Uh, Jesus is uh, punishing us. You're a man witch. You're now a man witch. Mm hmm. And casts him away. You're a man witch. <laughs> <laughs> Spelled like the sandwich. Okay. Sure. So. <laughs> Which is where that came from. That's where, that's actually where that came from. So her family went on to create Manwich. Yep. The sandwich filling in a can. <laughs> <laughs> I love that this story is less about paranormal romance than it is about like, that's how that was invented. <laughs> it's more about romance and capitalism, I'm finding. That's true. All about it, dude. That's a good point. Okay. So, (laughs) 
I won't say I'm what happened there. Getting the juices there. flowing. Yeah, I won't say what happened there for the benefit of the audience. I'm going to edit this part out, but that's hilarious that the tits come out when the show's <laughs> getting good. <laughs> Trying to get those juices flowing. Getting them flowing. Okay, so she casts I him like away. I like making you laugh. She casts him away, uh, calling him a man witch. And then what? Like he runs through the town and people are jeering and calling out to him. He just never leaves his house again or something like that. Or does he try to leave again and people... Should we have an extra added on scene, which is maybe only a paragraph long, of where he thinks, I need to get back out there. Like I got to get mayor. I don't know what, what would be his reason. Like I'm, I'm losing money here at the Forested Tip. Uh, I, you know, my, my inheritance can't last forever. I got to get out there and marry someone. And, but then people just keep making fun of the giant bat on his neck taking shits all over his beautiful pirate's blouse <laughs> <clears throat> and pissing all over his blouse. <laughs> Do bats have a cloaca? <laughs> <laughs> For the listener, in case you don't know, because I didn't know, Jackie told me while we were in Rome, was it in Rome about the cloaca that's just this giant hole that birds have that uh, piss and shit come out of? Yes. And also you can make sex to it. It's a hole that does everything. It does all of it. Mm-hmm. It's a a multi-use hole. <laughs> it's oh, the most efficient sharks hole, have right? cloacas. Ugh. Don't sexualize sharks. That's Tons weird. birds. It's like the about? time I had to watch that documentary about people trying to breed pandas, uh, and I watched a person with a glove on uh, who works at a zoo masturbate a panda to completion <laughs> and uh, collect what was uh, discharged. And I cannot look at pandas ever again after that. They sexualized a panda where I'm very uncomfortable when I see pandas. <laughs> what did its O face look like? It just kind of opened its mouth and looked adorable. That's yeah. upsetting. Yeah. yeah. I know. So I have a really tough time. I can't really look at pandas after that. That reminds me of the really upsetting information you gave me about guinea pigs last night. Yeah. Guinea pigs. We're just laying in bed, yeah, snuggling, go getting ready to go to bed. And Glenn goes, uh, you know they called they call guinea pig semen uh boar's glue. Boar's glue. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want me to tell the rest of it? <laughs> no, I don't want to scar our listeners like that. They'll no, never we're come scar back. Our listeners. Uh we already talked about my butthole in the last episode. <laughs> uh they uh, so I have a somebody with autism that I'm friends with, and he needed me to watch his guinea pigs while he was gone for two weeks uh, with his parents to go on some trip for Christmas. So my youngest was more than happy to watch the guinea pigs and let them run around the room. And the person was like, "Yeah, and can you send me videos and pictures? Because I love my guinea pigs so much." I'm like, "Yeah, absolutely." So doing that every day, taking pictures and videos of these guinea pigs and stuff. And sometimes the guinea one guinea pig would hump the other, even though they're both males. It would just kind of hump against them. And uh, and so I said, yeah, this is happening. And so my friend said, oh, don't worry, that happens all the time. But then one day my youngest came downstairs and said, uh, Dad, I think that one came on the other. And I said, where'd you learn that word? And uh, it turns out he did. And with that stuff comes out like crest and then hardens instantly like styrofoam and just got embedded into the fur. So I tried to get that out and that was possible. I looked it up online. It's called boar's glue. Sometimes guinea pigs will shove their little stuff into other guinea pigs' mouths and do the boar's glue down their throat, and they can choke to death and die. So now I never look at guinea pigs the same after that. That's awful, but what's more awful is I've been looking for do bats have a cloaca, which a little while in, I was like, well, no, they they don't have a cloaca. They're little mammals. Right, exactly. Well, aren't sharks? No, sharks are mammals. Shark, yes, but they do have... Sharks have cloacas. They're not mammals, are they? No. Whales hmm. are mammals. Uh, dolphins? Do sharks drop Whales? eggs? Dolphins. I don't no. think sharks drop eggs. I think they give live birth. So that makes them a mammal, right? Anyway, so the question is, do bats have cloaca? The answer is no. Bats do not have an anus. That does not help me even though I have so many more questions They have no need now. for it. They have to have an anus because they have guano flying out of them all the time. So where is the guano coming out of? They're piss if holes. They don't, I guess if they don't have an anus, it's they just pee? They have to have anus. That's for mammals and like all other mammals, they have a mouth and an anus. <laughs> a okay. mouth and an anus? I thought so. <laughs> That makes sense. Okay. So like bats all don't... Of mammals, they have a mouth and an anus. I love that we're trying to figure out, is a shark a mammal? Because they don't drop eggs. They actually give live birth. We're like, well, does it have a mouth? Yes. Does it have an anus? Yes. Then it's a mammal. <laughs> <laughs> that's, 
that's amazing. What makes a mammal? I think it's the live birth thing. Well, sharks do that. <laughs> <laughs> mammal definition, characteristics, and classification. Mammal, animal. Has mouth or anus? Question mark. <laughs> the young are nursed with milk. Do sharks oh. produce milk? Sharks sharks don't lactate. I guess that's the difference. Do sharks? Do, do whales lactate? Whales can't lactate. Are sharks mammals? Well, whales are mammals, so they have to. Sharks are not mammals. Sharks are fish. Sharks lack mammalian characteristics such as hair and lungs. Do not produce milk. Do whales produce milk? I'm looking that up right now. Some whales do. Anyways, this has nothing to do with our story. Um, okay, so... Where did we leave off? Pemberton gets gets cast away <clears throat> for... Cast away. Okay, so he goes back home, but then he thinks, what? Like, there's got to be a situation where people uh, jeer at him. Do they jeer at him on the way home and he never leaves again? I think maybe it should just be his own vanity. So he just never leaves because he knows he's not uh, his own vanity marketable anymore. keeps him inside in a depressive. So this is where he snaps awake um, or snaps up from his Boston newsletter. Uh, are we entering the heckler or the comic relief first? Have we defined place? I guess the heckler and stuff, that'll help define the place. So like suddenly after he's reading this. You have to leave Forested Tip Estate sometime. No, I know, but we've, we've defined the protagonist already. We've got his fault of bats that he used to be sexy. we got the year, we got the place. So then, yeah, I guess we can just throw in the ghost friends at this point. Maybe he goes outside to look up, like, to drink a glass of wine, unbutton his pirated shirt uh, down to the navel, and just look out at the night, uh, thinking about the sex he's had before. And, uh, uh, and then, like, as he gets wrapped up, in memories of the sexual experiences he's had on sultry nights like this, uh, the bat twitches around on his neck and reminds him that he'll never have it again. <laughs> Where it takes a shit on his chest. <laughs> and he's like, oh yeah, that's right. And then that's when the ghosts are like, ha ha, he shit on your chest. <laughs> the Newman character. <laughs> if I had a bat shitting on my chest, I'd never go outside to look upon the night. Yes. Well, all right. Uh, I don't know how to end this. <laughs> how do we end this? <laughs> so the next time you hear us, our sweet, dulcet voices, we will be <laughs> we'll be reading the first ever chapter of this book that is still untitled. Uh, we're still figuring that one out. Um, so we're going to read the first chapter, and then we are going to storyboard chapter two. Can we think up a title for the book on every episode? I think the first one coming to mind is uh, Shit in the Night. Wait. Shit in the Night. Now, I'm imagining That's really him not, standing it there has with, to like be a, sexier. with a cocktail. His shirt is open. Like Fabio. Like Fabio. He's looking out at the, the moon rising above the trees on his estate. He's, uh, but then the bat takes a crap on him. The what word makes a great wet title has to be in there. He's got a wet chest. He's got a chronically wet chest where his mom used to worry about it. <laughs> so, so he's wet. We're talking about pools. There's tons of bat shit. Wet chest in the night. Wet um, chest in the night. There you go. So that's a that's a placeholder title. We're gonna have to come up with a title every single episode. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> 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 well, with that, thanks for listening, and uh, we will see you. Should we try to do this every week? I think we could potentially, if we only give an we hour tops, can. an hour tops for writing. We literally have a timer, and we have to stop writing after an hour. Perfect. And I love it. Nothing gets reworked. There's no editing. We just do whatever it is because have I mean, you've read them? They're not good. They're really uh, most of the time they're really bad. Yeah, and so that's I think we what do that's the draw. That's why I read them. Yeah. All right. Fine. Well, with that, uh, I guess we're going to see you next week. Okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs>
My email is glenn.nuzzles, N-U-Z-Z-L-E-S, at gmail.com. You can also find us on Twitter, uh, at House Nuzzle. Uh, but don't bother us, because we're too busy working. <laughs>